Good morning, Wrightsdale. Good morning, church. It's great to, great to see you here this morning. We want to welcome you to our morning worship today. It's a beautiful spring Sunday morning. We're glad that you're here in the room. We see a lot of smiles, a lot of energy, and a lot of excitement, so we're glad that you're here. We also want to say good morning to everyone who's watching our online service. We're glad that you folks are joining us wherever you're watching from today, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube. We want to say good morning to you. And if you're watching our online stream today, we'd love for you to sneak down into the comments today and let us know where you're watching from. And that's a great encouragement for us. Well, friends, it's a great Sunday. I hope you've come today with a heart that's expectant. I hope you're coming filled with joy and just a wonderful day for us to worship together. Now, a couple of announcements for our church family just to keep you up to speed. Uh, we are going bowling tonight. We are going to take over the bowling alley. I don't think they know what's coming, but we, we know what's coming over there at the bowling alley tonight. We will be taking over. And so if you registered, if you registered to be a part of our bowling event tonight, uh, we will see you there. If you did not register, well, unfortunately, it is sold out. I mean, we've, we filled it up, and uh, we just are so excited to go bowling tonight. So if you registered, we will see you there, and it's going to be a great time. If you have any questions about that, the uh, times and everything are there in your bulletin. A couple other things I just want to make you aware of. There's a blood drive that we're partnering with, with Robert Fulton uh, Fire Company. That's happening this Tuesday, March 23rd. And uh, you and I both know how important that gift of blood is, especially during these times. So if you can come out this Tuesday, if you can make a blood donation, we're thankful for that. Those of you who've got kids involved in RAs, there's a sleepover that's happening this Friday night, March 26th. Info is there in your bulletin. If your kids are in RAs, make sure you are aware of that. Now, family, right in the pew in front of you there, you'll see one of these envelopes here for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And we just want to continue to encourage you to think about how you can give a special gift sometime between now and Easter. Uh, all of the monies that come in for the Annie Armstrong offering are used right here in North America. And this is something that we do as Southern Baptists each year to raise a special offering that goes to benefit missions 
and church planning and evangelism and all kinds of gospel opportunities right here in North America. So check out this video right now. Let's learn a little bit more about what God does with these funds. I really grew up in a very diverse neighborhood, and uh, that that's part of what led me to plant the type of church that we planted here at Gospel Hope. We wanted to plant a church in a very diverse area to say to our world that there's hope. There is gospel hope through the work of Jesus for a right relationship with God and a right relationship with one another. And we feel like the east side of Atlanta just beautifully represent that. As I was getting prepared to plant Gospel Hope Church, one of my deepest prayers was that the Lord would lead a brother to lead this plant with me. And I was praying for somebody that I would really identify with philosophically and theologically. And God in His grace answered that prayer way beyond my expectation by allowing me to meet Rod through a mutual friend. We got together and had coffee. And just as we began to get to know one another, we came to the conviction that we think we can do this better together than we can apart. We're on the same mission here. We're on the same team. And we've been able to reach a wide swath of people. And every Sunday, you have this beautiful picture of the diversity of God's kingdom. Absolutely. And people who I think their idea of what it means to win has nothing to do with, is it my idea or is it his or her idea? But does this idea or does this initiative advance the kingdom? People are black and white and brown and rich and poor and male and female and young and old, but fundamentally, we are all made in the image of God. We are sinners who need a savior. And we all, if we trust in Jesus, are made brothers and sisters by the work of his blood. And it is, it's it's one of the most deeply moving experiences of my life to be a part of a church that does display the reconciling hope of the gospel. Thank you so much for giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Because of partners like you, we are able to plant churches in places that desperately need a gospel witness. Amen. The gospel continues to move on, and uh, you and I have a privilege of partnering uh, with North American Mission Board and giving to the 2021 Annie Armstrong Easter offering. So if you are able to give, if the Lord would lay it on your those offering envelopes are there. You can also give online if you want to give through our website, rightsdale.org. They're in your bulletin. Uh, there is that Pinewood Derby race that's coming up. Pinewood Derby's on April 16th, and there's information in your bulletin. If your kids are involved in that or you'd like to come out and watch and cheer and have fun, it's going to be a great night. Information's in your bulletin. Also, I want to let you know just about a time change, a time change for that Easter event, the Great Egg Caper. The updated time is correct in your bulletin there, and it is Saturday, April 3rd at 6.30 p.m. So it is an evening event. We want to let you know that's coming, and that's for all of our wayfinders and their families. And if you have someone that you want to invite who's in that age bracket, we would love to have them come and be a part of that special great egg caper. That's going to be a lot of fun. Well, friends, I want to invite you to stand today, and we're going to open this service in prayer. We're going to turn our hearts to worship today, so let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this time, this beautiful Sunday morning that we've gathered together. We've gathered together in your name. And so, Lord, we just ask today that as we worship, that we would do so in spirit and in truth. Father, we come to you today because of your son, Jesus Christ. He is the one who has made the way possible. It's by his perfect life and by his death on the cross that, Lord, allows us to have this relationship with you. And Lord, today we want to celebrate all that you have done for us, the amazing grace that you've poured out on people like us, Lord, to, to make sinners like us part of your family, and Lord, to, to bring us alongside, to make us part of your mission, to share the good news of Jesus with this world. Lord, I pray that everything that happened in this service today would bring you honor and glory and praise. Lord, be in our midst today and move as we hear from you, as we celebrate you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. But now I see
Make a joyful noise to the Lord. He's worthy, amen. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Jesus is enough, isn't he? Amen. Amen. And all of you is more than enough for all of me.
devoted like a ring of solid gold like a bow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been and faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and it's why i sing your praise will ever be Not only with our voices and the words that we use, God, but with our lives, with our actions, with our hearts. God, may we never stop praising you. May your praise continue on from this life forward forever and ever. God, I pray that we would run the good race that you have set before us with endurance. 
and we would not look to the left or to the right. God, not be concerned with what our culture tells us is true and right. God, I pray that we would cling to truth, that we would cling to your word, that we would walk behind you and we would run the race with endurance, that we would praise you every day, every morning, God, that you are the first person we talk to, that you are the last one we say goodnight to, God, that it is everything, Jesus, 100% all day, every day. May we follow after you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength with your help through your spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. We're going to continue to allow the praise to be on our lips this morning as we sing worship to the Lord. Continue to praise him, church. Amen. Amen. Today, is it a good Sunday morning for you? Amen. Well, we want to say good morning once again to everyone who's joining us in our online worship. We're glad that you folks are joining us as well. We're thankful that God gives us this ability to have this technology to use it uh, to share his truth. Well, it's great for us to worship today, great for us to unite our voices together, sing God's praise, and uh, we're going to continue to worship now as we open God's word and uh, we get an opportunity to hear from him. Uh, If you're just joining us today, we are in the midst of a series right now that's entitled Bold Moves, and we're studying verse by verse uh, through one of the books of the New Testament. It's called 1 Thessalonians. It's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul, written to a brand new church, a new group of Christians who needed advice and counsel, correction and encouragement, and uh, we've had a great study in these weeks together, and we're going to continue to do that today. But just before we come to God's Word here in 1 Thessalonians 5, I want you to know that I've provided some notes for you that you can follow along in this message today that are right there in your bulletin. You can follow along, and uh, we're going to take just a moment here to pray. Let's just ask the Lord to help us, give us wisdom as we look into His Word today. So would you bow your head with me, and let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this Sunday morning, a brand new day for a brand new week, and Lord, we're here. We've set apart this time to come and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, it's our privilege to to lift praises to you. You are the God of the universe. You're the true and living God. Lord, you are the one who has spoken life, and Lord, thank you that you've spoken spiritual life into our hearts through your salvation, through what you have provided in Jesus Lord, as we keep studying your word today, I pray that you will open our hearts and minds, make us receptive and tender to what you have for us. I pray, Lord, not merely that we will learn some more facts about the Bible, 
but Lord, that we would be a transformed people and that your word would shape us and mold us. And so that, Lord, as we even as we exit this place today, that we will we will be your people. Father, thank you that you've brought us into this family. And Lord, there are relationships that have to be built up and strengthened and made healthy. And so as we talk today about relationships from this text, Lord, I just pray that you'll cause us to to be molded and shaped by the truth. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that's going to guide us in our thinking now. Thank you for the word of God. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, did you know that every day in America, more than 54,000 people get fired from their jobs? And did you know that in 90% of the people getting fired, in 90% of those cases, the primary reason why people get fired is because of personality problems? It's true. One study was actually conducted by the Carnegie Institute of Technology. They reported that approximately 90% of people who fail at their jobs do so not because of their skill level, not because of their competency, not because of their work ethic, but 90% of people who get fired from their jobs get fired because of their inability to get along with other people. Now, friends, maybe you've never realized it before, but that same truth can be applied to churches. Time and time again, what kills churches isn't outlandish theology, it isn't overblown budgets, it isn't uh, out, outrageous budgets. What it really is, is people people inside of the church who can't seem to get along. So in the end, what ultimately shuts down a church isn't Satan, and it isn't the secular world out there, but it's the church collapsing from within because of people's inability to get along and go along for the cause of Jesus. Well, church, today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you and I are going to learn that right relationships separate the bold churches from the broken ones. And that's really the big idea in this message today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Right relationships separate the bold churches from the broken ones. Now listen, you don't have to be an expert in church growth or church health to know that the churches that can't get along are going to be way less effective for Jesus than the churches that actually do know how to work together as one unified team in the task of the Great Commission. So friends, this is going to be such a a great text for us today, a great text from God's Word, because it's going to remind us today that being a bold church takes more, more than just right theology. There also has to be right relationships. And that's really the title of this message today, Right Relationships for Right Now. Now, if you've been with us for these last two Sundays, we've been studying through the end of 1 Thessalonians 4 into the beginning of chapter 5, where where Paul is giving this new church, this upstart church, he's giving them some much-needed correction, he's giving them some instruction, uh, not only about the return of Jesus, but ultimately the final day of the Lord. But family, while it is very important for Christians to understand those future things, what God is going to do in future days, I think it's more important for churches to understand how God wants us to live right now, right here and right now. Because listen, in the final analysis, churches are not buildings and churches are not budgets. In the final analysis, churches are people. We're, we're, we're a family of people. And so from verse 12 of chapter 5, all the way through the end of the letter, Paul starts to unpack a whole bunch of relationship insights that, that this ancient church and our church and really every church needs to learn how to embrace if we're going to be a bold church that's truly effective for the cause of Jesus Christ. 
So I want us to look here at our text in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to read this text together, and then we're going to highlight three relationship principles that churches like ours need to get right right now. Okay, so let's look at God's word here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You follow along with me as I read from verse 12 down to verse 15. Here's what scripture says. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Now, church, every single year in America, there are dozens and dozens of new books written on improving personal relationships. But here in this section of scripture that we just read, this morning, you and I are going to unpack three relationship insights that have a direct impact on the health and effectiveness of our churches. So, what are these three relationship insights that, that God gives us in his word? What are these great relationship principles that we all need right here, right now? Well, I hope you'll jot these down as we, as we consider them together. Here's number one. Right now, pastors must serve the church vigorously. Right now, pastors must serve the church vigorously. And we see this being emphasized in verses 12 and 13. Now, friends, I want you to see this. One of the most important things we all need to realize as we come to this text is that these, these relationship insights we're going to look at today, they are given to all believers. Now, don't miss that. That's why verse 12 begins where Paul says, and we urge you, brethren. Now, both of those words, the word you and the word brethren, they're both plural, they're in the plural. So in other words, they apply to all believers equally. In other words, we're all in this together. So the things that we're going to be studying today, it's all about what believers are to be doing together. Now here in a moment, we're going to talk a little bit further about what it means to recognize and esteem the spiritual leaders that God gives to us. But before we do that, I don't want you to miss this. Let's just quickly look at this brief little summary, this three-part job description that's here in these verses of what church leaders, and especially pastors, are supposed to be doing. So we're going to talk in a minute about how spiritual leaders are to be valued, they're to be appreciated in love. Well, if, if the church is going to do that, well, what are they supposed to be valued and appreciated for? Well, notice, notice what scripture says. You see the little job descriptions here for church leaders. Look at the first one. He labors among you. Do you see that? He labors among you. That word labor is a word that means to grow weary. It means to grow tired. It means to work hard to the point of exhaustion. So in other words, church leaders and especially pastors, they are supposed to be pouring their heart and soul into their duties as they're serving the church of Jesus. Pastors are supposed to work their hearts out. They're supposed to feed the sheep, and love the sheep. People ask me all the time, what are your primary responsibilities as a pastor? It really comes down to two things. Feed the sheep and love the sheep. That, that is what the Lord calls me to do with all my heart. Over in the book of Colossians, Paul wrote how he toiled in the ministry. How he toiled in the ministry. That, that's a word that means to, to work to the point of exhaustion. Now, I'll be honest. Most pastors that, that I know are the toiling kind. They're the hardworking kind. But for every nine pastors who are the hard workers, there's always one who isn't working so hard. Maybe you heard the funny story about this one pastor who, who never studied, never studied for any of his sermons, never studied. He just goofed off all week, but then finally Sunday would come, and he'd sit on the platform on a chair while the church was singing songs of worship and other hymns and he'd be praying over in the corner, Oh Lord, give me your message. Oh Lord, give me your message. 
Oh, Lord, give me your message. Well, finally, one Sunday, as he sat there desperately praying for something to preach on, the Lord spoke to his heart and said, Ralph, here's my message. You're lazy. Church pastors are supposed to work hard. They're supposed to work hard at preaching and studying and praying and counseling and loving God's people. That's one of the things they're supposed to get right. What's the second thing? Look at the next phrase there. He is over you. You see that? He is over you in the Lord. Well, that little phrase, over you, is talking about leadership. It's talking about leadership responsibility. The Bible calls the pastor the overseer of the flock. 1 Peter 5, verse 2, Peter says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Well, that talks about leadership. And that's what pastors are supposed to do. They're supposed to do it well. It's a serious task to be a pastor. Uh, To be a pastor means one day you're going to answer to God. You're going to answer to God for how well you did at bringing leadership to his local church. But did you see the third phrase there as we're thinking about the pastor job description? What he's supposed to get right? What's the third phrase there? He admonishes you. You see that? Admonishes you. That, that's a word that means to instruct. It means to exhort. It means to, to, to teach. So what scripture is saying here is that the pastor is supposed to be teaching the people with the truth of scripture. Now, let's be real honest. One of the saddest trends in American Christianity today is the near death of Bible preaching. The near death of Bible preaching. Uh, So much Bible-focused preaching is going to the wayside, and it's being substituted with a talk, a talk, or a sharing time. You know, in far too many churches today, theology has been replaced with therapy. And scripture has been replaced with psychology. And the cross has been replaced with comedy. But yet the Bible says over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul wrote those words to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. I charge you, preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with with complete patience and teaching. Well, friends, here in this message this morning, you and I are learning this important big idea that right relationships, right relationships separate the bold churches from the broken ones. And right relationships start at the top in the church. It starts with pastors and church leaders who bring love and leadership and and learning to the people. But what about the people? What do the people bring to the leaders? Well, that's next. Here's number two. Right now, right now, believers must respond to their leaders respectfully. Right now, believers must respond to their leaders respectfully. And if you look again, we're still in verses 12 and 13 here. You're going to see this truth come to light. Now, we took just a few moments, moments there to, to consider some of those leadership responsibilities that are in verse 12. But I want you to see this. The main emphasis of verses 12 and 13 is actually Paul urging Christians within the congregation context to make sure that they're showing respect and recognition and esteem to their spiritual leaders, to show respect to those pastors and those deacons, those church leaders. Notice the two key words there. Did you see it in verse 12? Look at verse 12 again. There's two key words. The first one's recognize. Recognize. That's a word that means to take notice of. It means to appreciate. And then there's that second word, the word esteem. Esteem. That's in verse 13. That means to value. Now, I know some of you are using the NIV Bible, the NIV translation. It hits, hits the mark here on this verse. Verse 13 in the NIV says it this way. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. So in other words, pastors and deacons and, and church leaders, they are to receive a loving esteem from their congregations. Not because of their dashing good looks, not, not because of their hipster clothing, not even because of their nice mannerisms. No, what does the scripture say? But because of, or the word is for, for their work's sake. Listen, let's be honest. Not every pastor is a good-looking guy. Uh, not every pastor has a, has a nice voice. 
Uh, maybe, maybe the pastor's voice is a little grating sometimes. Maybe he's a little nasally. Uh, maybe his clothes are a little outdated. Maybe his sermons or his Bible studies get to be a little dry from time to time. Maybe he's visited someone at the hospital or at their home when they're ill. And, and maybe his bedside manner is a little rough. But nevertheless, despite all of his shortcomings, whatever his shortcomings are, and every pastor, every church leader has those shortcomings, whatever they are, nevertheless, churches are still called to show that loving respect to their church leaders for the service that they're rendering in Jesus' name. Now, let me tell you a true story here. When I was a boy growing up in Maryland, one of the members of my home church was a guy who was very, very brash. He was brash. He was cocky. Uh, this man had major authority issues. I mean, he, he, did not, he did not want anyone telling him what to do. And this, this man, he did not have enough humility to fill a thimble. I mean, this was not a nice man. Now, most of our church, we had a great pastor, a great pastor who loved Jesus, who was a humble man. Uh, his name, we often called him in love, we called him Pastor Dave. Uh, other people in the church called him by his last name. His last name was Childs. So most of us called him Pastor Dave. Some people who were of the older spectrum called him Pastor Childs. But this particular man, this brash, cocky man, he constantly called our pastor Bucko. Bucko. Whenever this man was not getting his way in some gathering, whenever, whenever the church wasn't doing what he wanted the church to do, whenever the pastor wouldn't take his advice, especially in business meetings, he would chide the pastor, he would rebuke the pastor in public, and he would say, now listen here, bucko. Can you imagine that? Now, I remember I, at the time, I was only in fifth or sixth grade. And I remember being in a few of these meetings just in the back because my dad had to be there as a, as a deacon. But I remember even as a fifth or sixth grader, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I couldn't believe the contempt that this man had, the disrespect that he was showing towards his pastor. Friends, the point is, the, the Bible says we're supposed to show respect to our church leaders, our pastors and deacons, e even though from time to time we, we might have a disagreement with them. We may not agree with what they're making a decision upon, but we're still supposed to show them that loving esteem and respect. Up on the screen is going to come Hebrews 13, 17, which is from the New Testament. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and, and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Well, church, I want you to notice something here. I want you to see this. Don't miss this little connection, how Paul transitioned. He's talking about showing respect to leaders. But notice the very next phrase comes in verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves. Now, that's interesting. He goes from respecting church leaders to talking about peace. Well, this shows us that showing respect and esteem lovingly to our church leaders and being at peace, they are not separate issues. They're not two separate realities. They actually go together, just like a boat and a boat trailer go together. These two things go together. So, so you want a bold church? You want to be in a great church where there's really powerful productivity going on for Jesus? Well, then you need to support your leaders. You need to support your leaders in love. You need to stop undercutting them. Stop bad-mouthing them. In instead of promoting distrust, instead of uh, promoting conflict, you need to promote peace. Well, church, later on today, someone is sure to ask you what the message was about at church today. They're going to ask you most likely, what did your pastor preach on today? So I'm giving you the opportunity to burn this sentence into your brain today so that you can sound really smart to all your friends. What is this message about today? Here it is. It's this big idea. Right relationships separate the bold churches from the broken ones. Right relationships separate the bold churches from the broken ones. Now, so far, we've unpacked two principles that, that every church has to apply right here, right now. But we get to verses 14 and 15. Here's a third principle that we all need. Here's number three. Right now, 
believers must care for each other lovingly. Here's number three if you're taking notes. Right now, believers must care for each other lovingly. And we're going to see this get unpacked by Paul there in verses 14 and 15. Now, church, there's a good reason why President Ronald Reagan was called the great communicator. President Reagan was just one of those gifted people. He had, he had that perfect one-two punch of being able to say things that were, that were humorous, but also memorable. Some of you might remember back in 1981, uh, a would-be assassin tried to kill President Reagan, uh, tried to shoot him with a pistol. And President Reagan had actually been shot. The bullet ricocheted off the door and went into his lung. And President Reagan was slowly dying and needed to have this surgery performed to have this bullet removed from his lung. Well, it was said that Reagan quipped to his doctors as they rolled him in to prepare for this life-saving surgery. Reagan looked up at the surgeons and said, I hope you're all Republicans. That was such a classic line. But then there came a much more serious thing that Reagan said about six years after he was out of office. President Reagan had been out of office for some time, and he announced to our country that he was battling Parkinson's disease, the disease disease that would ultimately end his life. But of course, with, with characteristic optimism, as only President Reagan could do, he encouraged the American people to keep going forward to be optimistic about their future. And Reagan wrote these words. He wrote these words in a letter to America. He said, I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. But I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. Church, I want you to see in verses 14 and 15 here, this is the Apostle Paul encouraging this church to keep going the right way in relationships. If they're going to be a bold church, if they're going to be effective for Jesus, right relationships are so critical. And and so what does Paul call them to? Well, there's actually four words here, four power-packed words that come in a sequence here. So let's just look at them. What are those four words? Warn, comfort, uphold, and be patient. So let's, let's unbox these a little bit, all right? Let's unbox them like your kids like to unbox the cereal to get the toy at the bottom. Let's unbox these words a little bit and let's see what they mean. Look at the first one there. Paul says, warn those who are unruly. Warn those who are unruly. Now that word unruly was actually a, a military word. It's an army word. It speaks to soldiers who won't march in line. It, it refers to that soldier who keeps breaking ranks. Now, some of the older Bible translations have the word here as the word idle, idle. Now, in other words, Paul's talking about some Christians in this church back at Thessalonica who were being lazy, idle, sitting around. They weren't weren't working their jobs, they were being lazy, and they were causing trouble. They were stirring up trouble, they were refusing to work, and they were mooching off the church. And Paul says believers like that who are unruly, if they're troublemakers, if they're lazy, warn them. Warn them. They need to be spoken to. Now, unfortunately, we live in a day today when some Christians are too afraid of confrontation. Too afraid of confrontation. Even when unruly people are hurting the body. And that's a terrible mistake. That is such a mistake. This text says every Christian shares the responsibility of warning people who are troublemakers in the church. Someone needs to speak to that troublemaker to get back in line. So that's the first phrase. Do you see the next one, though? Comfort the faint-hearted. Comfort the faint-hearted. Well, here Paul is describing a group of Christians that are in every church. Every church I've ever been a part of has some of these people in it. They're here in our church. They're going to be a part of every church you ever attend. Well, who are these people? They're the faint-hearted. They're people who are discouraged. They're people who are battling disappointment or depression. Maybe it's their own spiritual immaturity. Maybe it's the difficulties of life or just crashing on them. But for whatever reason, there are these discouraged believers in the church. And they need, they need encouragement. They need some help. Now, how many times have you and I 
bumped into these people. We all have. They're in every church. We've bumped into that discouraged Christian. And the temptation, the temptation that we all face is just to listen politely. This is our strategy. Listen politely and leave quickly. Because we don't want to get caught up in something that may cost us time or energy or money. So we listen politely and then we quickly want to disappear. But church, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't turn away from those believers that are discouraged. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus have us to do? Well, he'd have us lean in. He'd have us really listen and bring comfort to those people that are really discouraged and who really need help. Now, do you see the next phrase there, uphold the weak? Uphold the weak. Again, this is all about relationships. When Paul talks about the weak here, he's not talking about people who are physically weak, you know, who need help moving a piano. No, he's talking about people who are spiritually weak. Now listen, when I take my daughter through the war zone, known as the Walmart parking lot, I will hold her hand very tightly as we walk and dodge the, the cars driving 50 miles an hour up and down the, you know, the roads there at Walmart. I hold tight to Hadley's hand because I know it, it's tough. Well, the Bible says we're supposed to hold tight to certain Christians. There's some people that need that firm grip on them a little bit. Maybe they're a, maybe they're a new Christian. Maybe they're a recent believer. They, they just recently believed on Jesus, and so they're very immature in their faith. Or maybe, they're a, or maybe they are a Christian who's just naturally weak in their faith, and they, they haven't really grown or learned, and, and they're still immature. They need help. We don't want to see those people get, get run over by false teaching. We don't want to see them get sideswiped by a bunch of worldly philosophies. Well, look at that next phrase, be patient. Be patient with each other. And I know you'll agree with me. You can tell me I'm wrong, but I don't think I am wrong more than any other country on the face of the planet. America. America is the land of the free and the home of the impatient. The home of the impatient. Go ahead. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. Those of you who, with the car in front of you at that stoplight, if they don't step on the gas pedal within two seconds of the light turning green, you are honking at them. We are the land of the impatient. If we, may, if we wait more than five minutes in line, we get angry. I mean, everywhere we turn today, it is impatient, angry people. Well, listen, if we're not careful, that same kind of angry impatience can start to bleed over into our church relationships. And that's why Paul tells Christians there in verse 14, look what he says there, be patient with all. Be patient with all. Friends, what a strategy that is. Do you know how many relationship bombs you and I could disarm in, in churches if we would just learn how to do this? How many bombs could we disarm if we would just be patient with people? How, how, how different might our churches be if we could all just show a little more grace and just a little more patience? Friend, do I have to remind us this morning how patient God has been with all of us? How patient is God with you and me on a daily basis? The way that he is so gracious toward us and so patient for all of our slowness to believe, all of our uh, hard-heartedness, all of our unkindness towards others, all of our shortcomings and sins. God is so patient. He is so patient. Well, listen, if you and I want right relationships in our church right now we need the same thing we need the, that same spirit of patience well after you get those four statements verse 15 then kind of hits almost like a big summary look at verse 15 when it comes to dealing with people don't do evil when it comes to dealing with people don't do evil paul says do good as christians we don't hold grudges we don't plot revenge we don't seek paybacks against people. No, no, that is not the Christian way. We don't, we don't do evil, we do good. We are to pursue what is good. So listen, friends, we need a reminder today. I need the reminder and so do you. This thing called church is not a solo album. Some of the albums you own are by solo artists. 
who are the single artists and they do their own song and their own music on the whole album. That is not church. Church is not a solo album. No, this album called Wrightsdale is a collaboration of various artists. The music is being played here on our album by a whole group of people. In other words, Wrightsdale is a community of contributors. We are a family of faith. And so is it any wonder then that the Bible has such strong language for us about relationships, right relationships, because right relationship, they make for a healthy church. Listen, if we're going to take the message of Jesus, if we're going to take this message of amazing grace and unstoppable love out into a world, well, listen, that amazing grace and unstoppable love has to start right here inside our own fellowship. Now, I know there are a lot of you listening today to this message, some of you in this room, some of you who are watching online. I know there are many of you listening today who are not a Christian. And when you hear this message, when you hear a message about how the church provides real love and, and comfort and community and, and support and that encouragement, when you hear that, that resonates with you because that's, that's something you are so desperately longing for. And maybe if we sat with each other one-on-one, -on -one, maybe, maybe you'd be honest. Maybe you'd say that over this last year, with all this COVID-19 craziness, maybe you'd say that, that this whole situation of life has really amplified your feelings of aloneness. Maybe more than ever recently, you've been feeling alone, you've been feeling isolated, you've been feeling cut off. And perhaps nobody else really knows those feelings that's going on inside of you, how desperate you really are, how alone you feel some days, how much you're hurting. And some days you, you might even wonder if, if anyone even cares. Listen, friend, I just want you to know this. Jesus cares. Jesus cares. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much he stepped down out of heaven and eternity to die on a cross so that you could be with him forever. Jesus gave himself for you so that you could be fully loved, fully forgiven, fully welcomed into his family. So friend, I want you to hear today, hear the loving voice of Jesus that is calling you. The love of Jesus calling you to come to him. Friend, don't wait. Don't wait another moment. Come to Jesus in faith. You can say from your heart, say, Lord Jesus, I've been hurting for so long. I feel empty. I feel broken and alone. But Jesus, I know you're the answer. So I acknowledge my sins to you. I acknowledge my brokenness. I ask you to forgive me and, and come into my life. Give me that abundant life. Give me that sense of purpose and that belonging that only you can give me. Lord Jesus, bring me into your family because I'm ready to follow you from this day forward. Friend, if you're making that decision today, if that's how the Lord is speaking to your heart, if you're making that decision to follow Jesus, would you connect with me today? Would you connect with me at the close of our service? I'd, I'd love to talk to you and just encourage you and, and rejoice with you as you take that step of following Jesus. Even if you're watching our live stream today, if you want to ask me a question or you want to connect with me or, or you're taking that step of following Jesus today, I hope you'll connect with me at the address that's there on the screen. It's ryan at rightsdale.org. Friend, nothing would make us happier today than to come alongside and, and see you take your step of faith to see you begin your journey with Jesus. Well, church, listen, today in this message, we've learned that right relationships are at the heart of a bold church. Churches are never going to be able to fight against the sin and the secularism and the darkness of this world. We're never going to be able to fight that if we're in here fighting one another. So Christian, maybe here at the end, maybe for just a moment or two here, maybe you could take a moment right now and think how you could start to live what you've learned today. Think about how you might begin to live what you've learned. How about we just start at the top and we'll work our way down when it comes to your pastor. 
when it comes to your director of family ministries, when it comes to your deacons, do you esteem them for the office that they hold? Do you lovingly value what they do and how they serve Jesus? Do you respect them for the hard work they give in serving the kingdom? When was the last time you communicated your appreciation to them in a real way? But then moving downward, what about your relationships with the rest of this church family? Do you have enough courage to tell that unruly Christian to get back in line? Maybe you see that discouraged Christian, that depressed Christian. Do you, do you have enough care and compassion to come alongside of them, to listen and, and to really encourage and, and build them back up? How about that weak Christian, that new Christian what about holding on to them tight? Don't let them go. Don't let them get poisoned by a sinful culture. Don't let them get dragged away into false teaching. And then how about your patience? How about that patience reflex? Are you exercising good patience with your fellow Christians at church? Are you as patient towards others as God is patient to you? And then lastly, are you, are you good at saying no to revenge? Do you say no to revenge? Do you say no to retaliations? Are, are, you, are you a person who says, no, I, I'm not seeking paybacks on people. I'm going to pursue what is good. Listen, Christian, I just want to hold out to you a challenge today, this loving challenge. I hold it out to every one of you. If you aren't doing right by relationships in this church, then it's time to make it right. Make it right. Go offer an apology to that someone. Sit down, have a Coke, have a coffee with them. Have a loving conversation. Talk it out. Ask for forgiveness. Give a handshake. Give a hug. Make it right. It's time to bury the hatchet. Let go of all the grudges. Stop the bomb throwing once and for all. You have to learn to let love cover a multitude of sins. Friends, this is the only way forward. This is the only way we can be a bold church for Jesus. So church, may we never forget, we're all part of the same team. We're all in the same army. We're all in the same family. We have to get this right. We have to get this right because right relationships separate the bold churches from the broken ones. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the word of God today. It's powerful, it's alive, it's sharp, it's living. It gets right down into the very heart and soul of who we are as people. Lord, and you know, you know in your divine wisdom that the church is not a building. It's not these bricks and it's not even our budget. Lord, it's, it's people. And so it's so critical, Lord, that we have these insights from you about having right relationships. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit today would speak to our hearts, and as only the Spirit can do in every individual situation, Lord, apply these truths so that we can take action where we need to, Lord, to have right relationships right now. Lord, so much is at stake. We have just one life to live for Jesus, one chance to be kingdom influencers for the cause of the gospel. Lord, we want our body to be healthy in every way. Lord, if there's someone listening or watching today who doesn't know Christ, we just pray, Lord, today would be the day that they would hear the voice of Jesus, that loving call, and that they would step out by faith and believe upon him, Lord, that you'd welcome them into your family even this day. Lord, we love you. What a privilege you've given us to be part of your body, your army, your family. Lord, help us protect our relationships so that we can be a bold church. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining together with us today in worship as we've learned more about God and what He has for each one of our lives. If you made a decision for Christ today, or if you would like to talk further about what God has done for you in the giving of His Son Jesus, I would encourage you to email me at the address that is on the screen, ryan at rightsdale.org. We would love to connect with you to help you begin a brand new journey with Jesus Christ. 
If you'd like to help contribute to our ministry and mission as we take this message of the gospel around our community and across the world, go to the link on the screen today and help us help others discover the message of God's love.